Hi, Ross. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in California? It's great. I mean, great to be here with you today. Um, it's nice and sunny in, in California, so no complaints on that side. Ross, Fission recently released a feasibility study on the PLS project, and I want to go through this, but before we do that, I want to provide a visual on where Fission Uranium is in the Athabasca Basin. Where is it in relation to NextGen or Cameco? Sure. Well, the Athabasca Basin itself takes up almost the, the full uh, northern third of the province of Saskatchewan. Um, we're on the west side, so we're really not very far from the Alberta border. Um, but uh, and then, and say, in relationship to NextGen, the aero deposit is about three kilometers uh, away from the Triple R deposit. So they're really, really close by. They're on the same major corridor that, um, you know, it's, it's fault zones and, you know, the same geologic corridor uh, that hosts both deposits. With respect to Cameco, I mean, they have ground around the Athabasca Basin, but their uh, primary focus has been in the eastern side of the basin, which is, I guess, as the crow flies around 200 kilometers to the east of where our uh, operation is and NextGen's property as well. Let's move on now and discuss the recently released feasibility study in the, and I wanna look at the economics behind the project. Why don't right. we just start with how many pounds are in the ground and, and what is the grade? As an overall global resource, we're looking at a hundred, little more than 130 million pounds U308 overall. Um, in the mine plan itself, uh, we're really using um, about a hundred million pounds in the in the resource, which equates to 93 almost 94 million pounds in the reserve. And let's look at the highlights. Why don't we just touch on the net present value, the internal rate of return, and also the payback? Sure, yeah. I mean, there's a, a number of great highlights in the feasibility study. The, the net present value, the NPV, using an 8% discount after tax, we're looking at $1.2 billion Canadian, so very healthy, and IRR, after tax, uh, just over 27%. So again, very robust, really healthy. You know, some other highlights that, that I think are, are notable from the feasibility study, we're looking at a 10-year mine life now. In the pre-feasibility, we were seven years. Uh, now we're 10. So I, I think that that was certainly a number that we were wanting to uh, achieve in the feasibility. And in fact, we, we did do that. So and I, I think maybe the other point I would make sure that people understood is this uh, feasibility study has really demonstrated that the uh, triple R deposit promises to be one of the lowest cost cash cost operators out there. We're looking at sub $10 a pound U308 US dollars, um, which is around $13 a pound Canadian. The PLS project is consisted of five zones. Are all five zones within that feasibility study? Yeah, right. So the, the, the triple R deposit, there's five zones. I usually uh, look at them like pearls on a necklace. You know, they, they there's around 200 meters, two to 300 meters that separate them from each other, but they're all along the same linear trend. Um, the feasibility study consists of three of those five zones. So the three in the middle, uh, the 840 west, the 00, and the R780 east. Um, they're the ones that make up the, uh, the the mine plan and the feasibility study. So there's still yet the uh, the two zones that flank on either side. Um, they can be part of the mine plan, we feel. I mean, they similar grade to the other zones. There's just not enough drill holes in there to um, be able to include them in, uh, in the economic study. But, you know, more drilling in the future, uh, we'll be able to convert those over, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So lots of room for upside. Great deal of upside on the project. It's, uh, you know, I mean, just speaking of the upside, we could, from what we know and have already delineated, there's growth there. All zones are, are still open at depth and, and a long plunge. In fact, we're learning quite a bit about it. Um, the drilling we did on the R840 West zone in 2021, not only converted 
that zone from inferred to indicated, which allowed us to use it in the in the mine plan. But it really demonstrated that the zone is uh, a lot better than what we thought it was going to be. It, it looks to be open open at depth. We have higher grade mineralization, not in the mine plan, down uh, below at depth. And you know, uh, it, it, it's to me, it, it basically shows that there's a, a great deal of growth potential in that zone. And another very interesting geological feature associated with PLS is that it's very shallow. And maybe you can just speak to this and tell us how shallow it is and how does it compare with what we might find in the eastern end of the basin, like on Cigar Lake or MacArthur, and what will this do to cost and economics? Yeah, it, it is extremely shallow. I mean, the, the top of the mineralization starts at 55 meters below the surface. The real deposit, uh, I would say, is from 55 meters to around 300 meter depth. That's really the, the bulk of the of the zone. Um, you know, compared to say deposits on the eastern side that you're referring to, the ones that are currently in uh, in production, you're looking at Cigar Lake, which is around 400 meters depth. You're looking at MacArthur River, which is closer to 600 meters below the surface. But they're totally different types of deposits too. They're all high grade uranium, but Cigar and MacArthur River are what you call unconformity deposits. So they're within the Athabasca Basin itself and right at the interface of the sandstone and the basement rock below. Ours is not only shallow, but it's also 100% in basement rock without any Athabasca sandstone cover on top. What that gives us is much more competent rock to work with so uh, you don't have the water issues that you tend to have in the in associated with sandstone. So you've got, I'd say, lower technical risk just by being in a basement rock host to begin with. Being near surface really, uh, you know, de-risk a lot of it or de-risk the cost, but also the you know the technical hurdles that's involved in mining as well. So it's uh, you know it wins on a, a number of fronts. And Ross, you mentioned earlier that there is lots of room for upside. And even though the feasibility study has been complete, will you still explore? Oh, uh, for sure. To grow this resource? For sure. We're, we're going, we've got a great deal of, of room to grow, as, as I mentioned, on the deposit itself and around the deposit. The whole Patterson Lake corridor is several kilometers long. Um, and, you know, if, just forgetting about property boundaries uh, a little bit. If you just look at the frequency of, of occurrences along that trend, you know, you have so far on the south, south uh, west side, we have the triple R deposit, three kilometers away, you've got the uh, next gen zero deposit, three kilometers uh, northeast of that, you have the Spitfire zone. It's just, you're starting to see a number of uh, deposits occurrence, a, a, you know, a, a sense of frequency. And we can still go the other way, of which you know on, on that on that corridor, which is 100% on on fission ground, I think, and that's very prospective for finding new mineralization uh, occurrences. But also, there's a you know, this is a very large land package, the uh, PLS. It's 31,000 hectares. We really only explored systematically between five five to ten percent of it. Um, we think that there's a, a great deal of exploration upside on, on the rest of the ground. And uh, we'll probably start, uh, you know, doing a more concerted effort on, on the exploration front, possibly in the latter part of 2023, certainly, you know, in, in the years coming ahead, you know, with the improved drain markets, I think it, it totally justifies us, uh, you know, having a, an, a, an exploration approach as well. And Ross, you mentioned that, the Spitfire zone is close. I'm not familiar with this zone. Who owns that? So this is on a, um, the property is a joint venture with Orano, Cameco, and Purepoint Uranium. So uh, again, it's on the same same trend. It's on the same corridor that hosts the Triple R and the Aero deposit. They have had some encouraging drill results there, high grade uh, results. Um, I'm not sure there's been a whole lot of drilling as of late on it, but it really does speak to the, you know, just the potential for for higher grade mineralization along this uh, along this trend. So, you know, in my mind, I like looking at the overall western side of the basin, and I just see this, 
there's almost no question that the the quality of the discoveries and advanced and development um, tells us that the western side of the province is going to be the next uh, the next generation of mines in the Athabasca Basin. So you, currently everything's on the eastern side. It will start shifting over to the western side in the uh, you know the latter part of this decade and certainly by the next uh, 2030s. And Ross, now that the feasibility study is complete, what are the next steps for Vision Uranium? Well, a lot of the the, uh, the next steps for us um, are focusing on the permitting and regulatory front, um, you know, which is basically all about getting uh, getting the project ready to be licensed to build and operate. Um, we'll be uh, entering formally into the environmental impact uh, study towards the end of this year, towards the end of uh, 2023. Um, that's one part of the, uh, you know, the activity, a lot, a large deal of our focus, permitting and regulatory. But the other uh, equally important part is securing relationships with our indigenous rights holders and our various local stakeholders in the area. Yeah, I think having the, the support of the people that live in the area in which we're operating is absolutely critical and vital towards getting uh, all the approvals necessary support for this project to turn into a uh, mining operation. And so we do put a lot of effort into building th these relationships. We already have uh, you know, all the key capacity and funding agreements in place with uh, all of our uh, key Indigenous rights holders in the area, and we're just we're using these as foundational agreements in which to continue to build, um, you know, uh, agreements and respect and you know long-term working relationship with 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 all the people in in the, in the northern part where we operate. And I'm sorry, what is the timeline associated with the environmental impact statement? Right. So we begin, as I said, formally towards the end of this year. Um, I expect the timelines to be somewhere in the order of 24 to maybe as long as 36 months before you would would have full approval to be able to um, to build and 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 operate, become a mining operation. So timelines there. Um, look, you know, we should successfully uh, complete the EIS by 2025-26, maybe the most positive um, number, base, base, uh, best case scenario would be sometime in 2025. Three years for construction, um, which we've shown in the feasibility study, it'll take roughly three years to construct, which puts you as a mining operation uh, by 2028-29. Don't you love the permitting process? You know, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not short, uh, but it is really, it's quite clear how you get there. And what I, I do like a lot about working in the province of Saskatchewan, is it's clear, it's spelled out, it's understood. These are the steps you have to take. There's no shortcuts to uh, to get there. It takes time, but, you know, uh, this, is, uh, this is the environment we work in, but, you know, there's very, very little political risk you know, so you may have other environments where permitting times are shorter, but the trade-off there is you may uh, see, you know, higher political risk. You know, every, everything is, is a bit of a trade-off, but I'm really, really happy to be working in Saskatchewan. We're blessed with the best deposits, uh, the, the best government system, the regulatory process is there. Yeah, I'm, you know, it seems long, but I think we can, uh, we can find our way through. So that's a great overview of the feasibility study. Why don't we move on now and discuss exploration? What do you have planned for 2023? Um, you know, as I said, we, we don't have any formal plans for exploration at the moment, but uh, I am considering probably in the latter half of this year to step out uh, doing some exploratory drilling on the, on the rest of the PLS property. You know, we're quite encouraged with, with the opportunities following the Patterson Lake corridor, but I think even more encouraging are, you know, just some, some targets that we've uh, seen on geophysics. There's, there's been, you know, a little bit of drilling we did a number of years ago that outlined the potential for mineralization further to the south um, by about a kilometer, we'll say, south of where the Triple R is located now. That looks like a great 
prospective ground to me. I would love to get the drill back in that area, look for um, you know occurrences of mineralization. We're seeing the highest radon anomalies on the property that occur from there. And those radon sources are generally not very far away. So it means that you, you do have a uranium source nearby and maybe reflective of high grade. So I'm encouraged with, with those opportunities. I think we'll start exploring towards the end of, you know, the, the latter half of 2023 here. And then of course we've, uh, we've staked other ground in the, uh, in the Athabasca Basin fairly recently as well. And I think that'll be also be part of the exploratory uh, uh, work going ahead. I'm glad you brought that up because you did stake land around West Clough which is or was a past producing mine. It has a very rich history. Maybe you can just tell us about that. Sure, well, the Clough Lake mine itself, the old past producer, it's about 80 kilometers north of, um, of our PLS property. Uh, it is connected by Highway 955 that, that runs up. In fact, that's why the road was put there in the first place to be able to uh, provide access to the old Clough Lake mine. Um, it was mined out by Orano. Uh, their predecessor was was Arriva, and I think or Fujima, I think at the time when they when they finished mining it out. But um, 62 million pounds of, of high grade uranium came out of the ground near surface. Uh, we've staked ground that basically is very close. It's within about three kilometers or so of the Clough Lake, the old Clough Lake operation. We're about three kilometers to the west of it, where our West Clough ground start and wraps around uh, a geologic feature called the, the Carswell structure. That's a basement hosted rock sitting in the middle of the Athabasca Basin. It's basically an uplifted tube of basement rock. Uh, for whatever reason, there was the, the high grade Clough Lake uranium deposits associated on the flank of that, um, that structure. And we basically staked, staked the whole Western flank of, of the um, circular carswell structure so really good uh, uh, geologic potential I think you know there's not been a whole lot of work done in the area there in the past but that's something we're you know we've been very successful in as a group is taking you know various concepts like this and then yeah uh, testing them and turning them these into world-class deposits I mean it, it's what we've done before in the past and uh, I'm hopeful we can uh, continue uh, doing the same going ahead Ross, let's move on to your balance sheet now and discuss financials. You are sitting on $40 million in cash and short-term investments. How are you going to allocate this cash in the coming year? So really, that money that we have right now, $40 million, is earmarked for the uh, the type of work we're, we're doing right now, which is um, the advanced engineering design. Uh, next year, we'll start getting into procurement. Um, work as well uh all the costs associated with permitting and regulatory work plus community um agreements and uh, so you know so i think that we're probably in in a you know a really nice position we're, we're certainly good for everything we're, we're underway in 2023 we're covered for most of 2024 as well so there isn't a huge need to raise new capital but that's really where that uh 40 plus million dollars is earmarked towards um, any of the exploration activities I'm talking about right now. I haven't uh, considered the financing aspects of them yet. So we haven't, you know, the, the funds that you're seeing in the treasury really are devoted to the uh, to the work that we're doing to advance triple R through the regulatory and uh, uh, I guess the advanced engineering process. Ross, I want to move on now and discuss valuation. Uh, when you look at pounds in the ground, Fission is trading relatively cheaply compared to some of your comps like NextGen or Denison. How do you explain that? Um, well, I think, you know, in uh, a lot of cases, it's um, they're further, you know, they're further advanced along the timelines between uh, where they're currently sitting and production. For example, I think NextGen are about a year and a half to two years ahead of us on the uh, on the timelines. They've already entered into their environmental impact assessment. But as we've uh, progressed our project moving forward, we have actually considerably um, decreased that valuation gap. If we had this conversation 
say three years ago, I mean, we were about a three to one differential between our valuation of towns on the ground and next gen and, and Denison. Well, that's now uh, close to less than about a, a two to one. I think that as we continue to move the project forward, show that yes, this is a very robust, viable prospect for turning into a mining operation. I think that that valuation will continue to close and uh, you know, we're obviously looking to be measured on par with, with, with the competitors, but I think you know, we've made great progress in the past and it's really all about uh, having folk refocus this company on the asset that we have and moving it forward through development that is uh, that has been what's allowed us to be able to close that gap and i think as we continue to move along we will um you know i think we're going to achieve par with the with our uh, other competitors as well so there is a great value proposition for investors to take a look at vision so it's all about de-risking much of the story is in de-risking De-risking and continuing to show the value, and you know that they be able to show that it is economically robust, um, yeah, which I guess is part of de-risking. But yeah, one of your largest shareholders is CGN, a large utility out of China. Maybe you can just tell us about that relationship. How much do they own, and how active are they? So CGN, you know, one of the two uh, Chinese state-owned utilities. They um, invested in Fission back in the, er, I guess it was January 2016. They initially bought a 19.9% equity stake in the company. Also was an offtake agreement in there as well. Um, over the years, they have not uh, participated in, in you know, future financings that we've done. And so their, um, their overall percentage has actually decreased now to about 13.7% equity ownership. Um, they've not sold any shares in, in the company at all, but it's just they've been diluted down, somewhat not participated. I think they've been a great partner, to be honest. You know, everybody understands the, you know, the the Chinese growth story. Um, you know, they're they're you know, as far as on nuclear power buildouts, there's nobody stronger than the Chinese that way. Um, but I think you know having a you know a, a less than a you know 15% equity stake in, in, in the company, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with with where they're they're at right now. As I said, there is a uh, an offtake agreement for up to 20% of our production that they would be paying uh, market price for spot price. Um, so I think they've been a, a great partner there. Uh, you know, ultimately, um, you know, they're probably interested in having access to to pounds to uh, to help uh, you know supply their their ever growing fleet of, of reactors in China. But um, you know, I think it's been it's been a good relationship uh, and probably will continue to do so. I know there's a little bit of international tension out there between um, China, Canada, uh, still have a good relationship with China, U.S. maybe a little less so. Um, so we'll have to see where that all goes, but for the time being, uh, you know, I think we're we're pretty comfortable with with that relationship, and you know, hopefully it'll uh, continue to um, to remain that way. Ross, you also made a couple of recent additions to your management team and your board. Why don't you just tell us about those additions? Sure. At the at the board level, uh, we've recently announced uh, the addition of Beatrice Orantia. Um, she comes with a great deal of ESG and sustainability experience, so that brings a whole other, um, you know, needed component to, uh, at the board level. Uh, also, a recent hire on the technical team operations. We have our environmental manager now uh, with, so it really builds our horsepower internally, understanding the whole uh, regulatory and permitting regime so i you know i think we're firing in all cylinders right now as, as a company i'm really quite pleased with our new additions ross as we wrap up what can investors expect in terms of news flow in the coming months from vision uranium right well i think just overall um you know i think we're really in a strong uranium bull sector right now and of course we you know we'll continue to remain active we will be advancing PLS, we know that, um, you know, it certainly has a, a an excellent pathway through to production. Uh, news, of course, will be reflecting our steps as we as we move along through this, this year. 
um, look for us to announce where we are in the regulatory, where the permitting front, um, look for further agreements with our uh, local rights holders in the area. And I think as we, um, you know, perhaps as I mentioned in the latter part of, of 2023, we may be announcing further exploration work as well. So, uh, you know, I, I just think the whole sector is doing phenomenal and, and our project, of course, just continues to move forward. So I think there's plenty of news flow out there, um, you know, to keep, keep investors, uh, you know, looking, keeping eyes on our story. Well, that was a great overview and a great update on Fission Uranium and congratulations on the feasibility study. That's a nice way to start the year. Once again, Ross, thank you. Thank you very much.